fact, in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, we are still in chapter 20 and still, hopefully for the last time this morning, looking at Paul's farewell sermon to the Ephesian elders. We'll read the last section of that this morning from verse 29. Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me in all things, I have shown you that by so toiling, one must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had spoken thus, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and they all wept and embraced Paul and kissed him, sorrowing most of all, because of the word he had spoken that they should see his face no more. And they brought him to the ship. Amen. And thanks be to God for his word. Last week too, just as I did. It's not surprising. Well, we come back to share now uh, the last part of Paul's speech. We're in Acts chapter 20, Paul's farewell to the elders of Ephesus. Now that farewell runs all the way from verse 17 of this chapter to the end, if we include the parting itself. (coughs) And we've dealt with it in three parts. First of all, Paul speaking about his own ministry, that is, of course, his ministry in Ephesus, (coughs) verses 18 to 21. And then he speaks to the elders about his plans for the future, obviously commending himself to them and to their prayers in the midst of doing that. And finally, here we are this morning looking at the last section where he's speaking not about his own future, but about the future of Ephesus. Uh, and in particular, he's speaking about the ministry of these elders. <coughs> in Ephesus, warning them, above all warning them, of a danger that he is convinced is facing them, the danger of those coming in from outside and those arising from within who will trouble the church. And he does this before he parts with his friends. Now we tried to look at this last Sunday morning, but the richness of verse 28 took up all our attention and all our time just as it did with our young folk. They found the same thing as we did. Just to remind us, let's read together that verse. Take heed to yourselves, Paul begins, and to all the flock (coughs) in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for, that is, to pastor the church of God, which he obtained with the blood of his own, it says literally, with his own blood meaning, of course, the blood of Jesus, his Son. So, before he goes on to warn them as he does, he tells them about the value of the church of Jesus. He reminds them of the value of every single member, every single Christian. And their value is measured and must be measured in nothing 
other than and nothing less than what God has paid. The purchase price of the church is the purchase price of every single believer. That is the blood of Christ, the life of God's own and only Son. Now, because of that richness that we found in verse 28, I'm sure you share with me a lack of any regret that we took time to look at it. But now we must press on. Now, for all that Paul began his address to the elders with a description of his own ministry, he claims no personal high ground in doing so. He claims no great achievements, no achievements greater otherwise, in fact, which is really quite remarkable. His only claim, as we saw in verse 19, was that he served. And it's a service that he describes as in humility and with tears. The content of that service, he tells them, was the faithful preaching, not just of the Word of God, but of the whole gospel. He held back nothing. He held back from nothing. Paul knew what we all should know. What all that is especially leaders in the life of the church should know. That the Lord Jesus Christ requires of his servants just one thing. That they be faithful. Faithfulness for Paul meant not shrinking, that's the RSV words, from teaching anything that was profitable. And by implication, he is saying, including those things which could be challenging, those things which could be unwelcome. Sometimes we must be challenged, and sometimes we need to be upset. If there are dear folk in the church who have fallen into a careless apathy about the gospel, or if there are those who have not come to know Christ as Savior, nor to serve Him as their Lord, then they must be told that they have a problem and required to face that problem. They must be told that if you are like this, if you have this problem and will not take it to God now, then God one day will take it up with you. Now that may not be comfortable. It may be upsetting. But it has to be. And because there are always people in this position, the problems Paul is speaking about are now focused on those coming from outside the church, verse 29, and those arising inside it, verse 30, to disturb the flock of God. What Paul is saying is very simple. He's saying there is trouble coming from outside and from inside your fellowship. Now, you, the elders of Ephesus, you who are the leaders of the fellowship, are responsible for this in that you must deal with it. And so we see once again that Christian leadership under God is the key to a congregation's life. Paul knows and knows very well that a divided leadership, a confused or an apathetic leadership, will have one kind of effect, and it is not good. While a united and informed and dedicated leadership will have quite another kind of effect on every congregation. And this is Paul's concern. He says, I know. How he knew, we have no idea, but he knows. After my departure... Fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, 
and from among your own selves men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples afterwards. This is why Paul is so determined to warn the elders. Because only as the leadership of the church is faithful can the church be faithful. Only when the leaders are faithful to Christ can they expect others to be faithful to him also. Now this is true in every area of the Christian's life and of the church's life. It's true of worship. If we are not faithful to God in our worship, then something else will result. It's true in the area of prayer. It's true in the area of attention to the teaching of the faith, the teaching that arises, of course, from the Scriptures. It's true in personal life. It's true in service. If the leadership of the church is not faithful, how can the church be expected to be faithful to Christ? And it's also, as Paul knew very well, a matter of credibility. A leader of the church who subscribes in some form or another to the importance of worship and prayer and witness to the world, but is not engaged himself in these things, has scarcely any credibility. Now I would assume, surely you do also, that the elders of Ephesus dearly wanted to be what Peter calls examples to the flock in these things. And I assume also, don't you, that leaders in the church of Jesus today want the very same thing. That they want to take their part in worship and prayer. That they want to give proper attention to the teaching and preaching of the gospel. That they want their personal life to be right and they want their service of God to be an active one. Surely they do. And surely all leaders of any kind in the church of Jesus must want these things as a matter of priority, because that's the substance of their calling. But naturally, there are those who start out from here. But things go wrong for them. And they're not fully engaged in these things anymore. They're not giving the lead that they should anymore. Something has gone wrong in their lives. Now that's the danger of which Paul is very aware. The reason Paul is saying all this, the reason Paul is calling for this kind of eldership is that he clearly sees the danger of another kind, a different, a lesser eldership, and that for Paul is a dangerous thing. He has already seen this very problem arising in Corinth. Remember that during his period of waiting, he writes, that is waiting uh, for word from Titus, he writes the letter to the Romans, and during this period of his life also, he wrote the letters to the Corinthians because he's waiting for that reply through Titus. And of course, you know that much of the writing to the Corinthians comes out of a deep concern for the divisions in that church. Think of Second Corinthians chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, all of these chapters, all concern for things going wrong in the church. He has seen it happen in Corinth. He has seen the leadership go wrong. He has seen people infiltrate the church and begin to change it. He's seen those arise within the church who have led others astray. And he's concerned that what has happened in Corinth will not happen in Ephesus. But he knows that there's going to be temptation. He doesn't say, I think there will be fierce wolves and I think there will be false teachers arising. 
He doesn't say they might appear. He says they will arise. They will appear. Force, rather fierce wolves will come from outside. And false teachers will arise from inside. Do you remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount? Warning of exactly the same thing using exactly the same figure. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. But inside, they are ravenous wolves. And where Jesus speaks of himself as the door of the sheep and the good shepherd who lays down his life for the flock, you know, he identifies exactly these two groups of people that Paul does. John chapter 10. He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. There's somebody who breaks in. But there's also those within who are not truly committed to the work of the flock. Jesus later says, He who is an hireling, not a shepherd, to whom the sheep do not belong, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Fierce wolves will arise. False teachers will appear. Now, they have been appearing throughout the entire history of the church of Jesus and will continue to appear until the last day, of course. But was Paul right? Well, remember that his young lieutenant, Timothy, was left behind in Ephesus. What does Paul say to Timothy? Just as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. He's right. He's now having to write to Timothy to deal with the very problem he warned the elders about. Warn them, he says, not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than divine training in the faith. And when he speaks to Timothy in his second letter, he warns him of exactly the same thing. Do you remember? 1.15 You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me. And so later in that letter, he is to warn them, warn Timothy directly about those who cannot endure sound teaching. The time is coming when people will not endure it, not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own likings. People who sit in the pew and they listen and they don't hear what they want to hear or think they should hear. And so they stop listening and miss the very word of life. And what does the risen Lord Jesus Christ have to say to Ephesus? To the angel of the church in Ephesus, Revelation 2, write this. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear evil men, but have tested those who call themselves apostles but are not. So at least up to that point, they listened to Paul And had the reputation of dealing with these problems. You found them, he says, to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently, bearing up for my namesake, and that you have not grown weary. Yes, but I have this against you. That you have abandoned the love that you had at first. So they weren't so very careful. I suppose the question we can ask is, would Paul have had to write the way he did write to Timothy? Would Jesus, the the risen Lord, have had to speak to Ephesus the way he did if they had listened to what Paul said, if they had paid heed to the warning, be alert? Now, the first 
the first response we have, the first answer that's given is one of being watchful. Verse 31. For three years I was amongst you warning you. Did the Christians become fed up of the warnings? Once more, Paul says, be watchful. Be alert. What do you think he's referring to? Isn't he referring firstly to the need to be alert in prayer? Isn't that the way the Lord Jesus himself used that figure of being awake as a matter of prayer? Be alert, he says. And then in verse 32, he gives us the second part of the answer, almost the antidote to the poison. He commends them to God and to the word of grace, to the gospel, to the whole gospel which is able to build Christians up and to guarantee eternal life. All genuine growth in the Christian life, all genuine growth in your Christian life comes through the word of grace. If that is the case, and the Bible assures us that it is, why are some Christians so ready to stick with something less than the full preaching of the gospel? Remember that the cost of being a Christian, that the price and value of the church is found in the gift of Christ himself. So why would anyone hold back from this costly way? For Paul and for Lucas, he records all this. The fact is that those who lead in the church of God Don't stand over God's word with control of it. But they stand under God's word with the rest of the flock. Again with reference to Ephesus, Paul writes to Timothy and speaks about guarding the truth which is entrusted to you. It's a gift. It's a trust. It's not something that you have any say over or can alter or add to or take away from. Here is what you do. You must be alert. You must be watchful in prayer. And you must place yourself under the authority of God and of His Word of grace. And those are the bases of His last appeal. His last appeal to the Ephesian elders are for selfless living and of self-giving. All that you've heard, Paul is saying to them, must result in changed lives. Look at my example. Not that he is proud of himself, but that he knows that he has been an example to the flock. He has been, verse 35, a shepherd, not a sheepdog, leading the flock, not driving them. Is that not what God calls us to, especially those of us who are called to any position of leadership in the church, to be examples And so they part painfully with prayer. And we leave Paul this week to take up his story later. We leave Paul this week grimly setting his face towards Jerusalem, just as Jesus did. Leaving the Ephesian elders and leaving us this morning to be alert and to place ourselves under the authority of God and His Word of grace. This is what the Spirit is saying. This is what God is saying through the Spirit to the church and especially to its leadership. Be alert. 
place yourself under God's authority and under the authority of his word of grace. Take heed to yourselves and to the flock of God. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-blessed God, as you have called us into your service, so you have equipped us to meet and fulfill that call. Forgive us, O Lord our God, if we have been careless, if we have not been alert, not engaged our hearts and minds in prayer with any sense of urgency. And forgive us, O Lord our God, if we have not seen that if we will place ourselves under your authority, we must place ourselves under the authority of your word. And bring us to yourself and take us on from here so concerned and committed to a path of obedience that we will see blessing. Others entering the flock and fold of Christ. Others coming to him. The church going on from strength to strength to the glory of his name. Amen.